Let's open up in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Jesus, for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here today, Father. Forgive us of our sins, Lord God in heaven, that we may come to your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart. Father in heaven, we just want to pray, Jesus, for all those who are coming to our minds and hearts, Father, that you would provide healings, Father, whether they be spiritual healing, whether they be physical healing, whether they be mental healings, Father God in heaven, financial healings, Lord God in heaven, Come and speak to our hearts. Come and provide for us. Protect us, Father, as your promises proclaim in the Bible. Lord God in heaven, we just hang on to those promises, Father, and they guide us and they, Father, give us wisdom. So, Lord God in heaven, we just thank you, Jesus, for your promises. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for loving us as you do. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, Jesus. We love you with all our hearts, minds, and soul. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and say amen. So I'm so glad, like I mentioned earlier, that you can join us today. We're going to continue our journey in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Last week we covered verses 1 through 3. Today we're going to cover verses 4 through 7. And the Hebrew author is going to take us to a place to remind us of the people who had much faith. And through that faith, they found much pleasure in God's eyes. Matter of fact, they were considered righteous men uh, in God's eyes because of the faith that they had. So it's exciting uh, to start to look and see how God perceives what a righteous person would look like what faith in our lives should look like to stay righteous in God's eyes. So it's going to be uh, interesting. So let's, uh, let's start in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. So when's the last time you put your trust in God? When's the last time that you really had an issue that you could see no way out, and you just trusted in the Lord that He would make a way, He would provide for you? That's an important question, because that's what guides us. That's where our faith starts, is putting our trust in God when we have trials and tribulations, when we know that we can't see a way out, but we know that God has a way out. He has a solution. When's the last time we did that? Because that's the building of the faith. That's the tools that God uses to build our faith. Do you look at circumstances in a sense with peace or in a sense of peace? Every circumstance that comes uh, your way, you have a peace about it. Or do you panic? Are you frantically trying to come up with solutions on your own? Or again, do you go to God with trust, knowing that his solutions will be the perfect solutions? Do you believe having faith in God pleases him? We're going to find out today in, in, in the message that through faith, through the faith that we have, it is pleasing to the Lord. Because through that faith, we will diligently seek Him and diligently want to know Him more. It's through that faith that God pours into us that gives us the path to the kingdom of heaven, to eternal life, to find righteousness in the eyes of the Lord. In conversation, are you sharing your faith in a godly way? And what I mean by that in a godly way, are you, does someone come up with a problem and you give them the world solution? Or through your faith, do you invite God into the conversation? Do you have conversations that lead with the Bible teaches us this, or the Lord says this, the Lord promises this? If you're doing that in your conversations, you are not only building faith in you, you are not only reverencing the Lord Jesus Christ, 
but the people that you are ministering to and with are coming into that same faith circle. Our faith will exude from us the more faith that we have. And people will want to know what that faith is. And they'll want to know where we get our faith. And that's the perfect opportunity, the perfect time to share your testimony with the Lord Jesus Christ. And share with them how that in your circumstances you get through them, through the faith that God pours into you. And sharing is it always pointing to the biblical promises or solutions. This is similar to the question we just asked in sharing your faith. And are you always pouring in? Are you always giving God glory in your life? When we don't see a way out, God, I guarantee you, has a way. He has a way out. And when we don't see the way out, what we need to do is we need to focus on God because through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Father, He will provide a way. He will show us the light. He will lighten the environment we're in because why? Because Jesus is the light. And there is no darkness where Jesus exists. So we can enlighten others through our faith. And they will want to know, why are we so strong? Because, and the indication that they will want to know is they will continue to come back to you. They will continue to ask you for prayer. They will continue to talk to you about why you are so strong in Christ. And you, as a minister of God, has the opportunity to share and share your testimonies. And build strength in yourself and build strength in them through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the faith he pours into us. Do you believe in faith? You will become closer to God. And let me rephrase it. Do you believe your faith will allow you to get closer to God? And the answer is, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, as the Bible teaches us in, in Matthew, that we can do all things through Christ. We can move the mulberry tree. We can move mountains. But it's through the faith that we have in Jesus. It's through the faith that we have in God that we can do these things. So, how is your faith going to grow you closer to God? And we're going to learn that today. And we're going to see some good examples of how God works in all lives to build faith so we can become closer to Him. Because what is God's ultimate goal? God's ultimate goal is to have us become closer, to develop that personal relationship with Him and his son, to live a life for eternity with him in the kingdom of heaven. That's the purpose. To rely on God and the son for all things. To share the good news, the word of God, with everyone that we possibly can. When we come into contact with people, do we share God's word? Do we share faith? Do we offer a prayer? And those are questions that we should be pondering all the time. And if we are not, we have to ask, why aren't we? And if we are, we have to ask the Lord and thank the Lord that he's pouring into us. But if we're not, we need to ask the Lord to pour that strength into us, to pour into us the courage, the boldness to share the word of God. And believe it or not, the Lord will do that. He will give you a boldness. He will create opportunities to build your faith, to strengthen you in his word, to strengthen you to share the good news in the gospel. 
And in some cases, our personalities, you know, will push away because we're shy, because we're uncomfortable, because we believe that we have to be fully equipped before God can use us. But what, what does the Bible teach us? God equips the called. And he will equip us. When he is calling you into ministry, God will equip each and every one of us to perform the duties that he has uh, laid before us. He will equip us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That means in life. That means in for eternity. But that also means for the work and the service that he is asking us to do for him. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will never let us hang out to dry. He will always be there. And we always know this, that he will be there when we call upon him. And he's there even though we don't call upon him, waiting for us. Call his name. To give him an opportunity to pour his love, his faith, his mercy, his kindness into us, his grace. So let's look at um, last week. The author defined what faith is, how God will bless us through his faith. And when you cannot see God move, he is there. When you cannot hear God, he is there. When you cannot see God, he is there. When you cannot feel God, God is there. God is always present in our lives. It's us that turn off or shut the door on God. Remember, God is omnipresent. And when he's omnipresent, he is always there. And it is through our relationship, through our actions, that we either open or shut the door, meaning that we either invite the Lord in in all of our lives or we shut him out on some of our lives. And in some cases, people will shut them out, shut him out in the most critical times in their lives. And conversely, some people in the most critical time in their life will turn to God. But that's the only time they turn to God. God wants a ebb and flow, a even relationship. And what does that mean? What does that look like? That means you invite God into your everyday life. You put God first. You allow the Lord to go before you and before me when we start our day. And we always are thanking God for the things that he's doing in our lives. So this week we see that faith will lead us closer to him. As we continue on in our walk, our faith should increase because God associates faith with a righteous person. And we're going to see some examples not only in verses 4 through 7, but continuing on in chapter 11. The Hebrew author was compelled to give us example after example, biblical example, of men and women of faith. And we're going we're gonna to see how faithful these men and women were and how God considered them very righteous based on God's actions towards these men and women. So let's, uh, break, let's open up uh, our Bibles. I'm reading the New King James Version. Uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. So verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had testimony that he pleased God. But 
without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In verse 7, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So there's a lot to break down here. Let's jump back to verse 4. And let's talk about, you know, the examples so far that God has given us, that the author of Hebrews is pointing us to as examples of men of faith. Let's talk about uh, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. So you look at this verse, and there's a lot that the author's telling us. And, you know, it, when you read it the first time, it's a little bit confusing. But as you meditate on it, the words become more prevalent in our lives, along with uh, the example that the author has given about Abel. So we all remember the story of, of Cain and Abel. Abel was the first recorded murder in the Bible. And there was a difference between Cain and Abel. They were brothers, as you recall. One was a farmer. One was a sheep herder. God asked for sacrifices from both. Cain gave, you know, the fruits and the vegetables that he grew from the ground. Abel gave a, a um, sacrifice of a lamb and the fattiness of the lamb. Remember, in the Old Testament, the Lord wanted the fatty part of the lamb because that was the best part. And so they both gave sacrifices. Here's what we need to know, though. The Bible is unclear on why um, God was dissatisfied with Cain, but he was satisfied with Abel. But there's a couple of instances where we can, you know, look at the Scripture, and we can try to determine what that really means. So let's look at Genesis 4, 3, 5. And in the process of a time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So you can conclude a couple of things just by Scripture, that Cain was very displeased with the way God received his offering. Abel was very pleased with the way God received his offering. And when it says in, in the book of Genesis that Cain's countenance fell, God probably viewed that as a, a sense of pride, a sense of how dare you um, not receive the gifts that I've given you, the sacrifices. And then he turned his pride and his jealousy towards his brother. And that's where the murder occurred. And there isn't much more that the Bible tells us on the exact reason why. So we shouldn't read into it so much. But we know this, that Abel giving the fattiest parts of his sacrifice to the Lord meant that he had a lot of faith. And it's also speculated or postulated in the Bible that Cain did not give God his first fruits. He didn't pick the best fruits or the best vegetables. He just grabbed a basket full of whatever and handed it over to the Lord. And if we know anything about God, he knows all. He knows our heart. He knows everything about us. And he knows our intention. If we try to hurry through pleasing God, God knows that. But if we faithfully try to please God, God also knows that. And I think that's the distinction here between uh, Cain and Abel. 
And it's just interesting how that we see it tied to an event, a heinous event. You know, the murder, a brother murdering a brother over jealousy, over pride. And do we think God knew that outcome? We absolutely do, because again, God knows everything. God knows it all. Let's look at another scripture. Let's look at Matthew 23, 35, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Again, the author is bringing to bear who God perceives to be righteous. Now, he introduces, he, he continues on the story. And this is Jesus talking now about the blood of the righteous is being shed by the enemies of God. So we have to be careful. And we have to understand that there are enemies of God out there. And God's people are enemies of God. Or God's people, I'm sorry, are the enemies of the enemy of God, is what I meant to say. So we look at Abel, and, and the author tells us, through Abel and through the blood of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was preaching in the courtyard in Israel. And the Israelites decided to kill him because he was saying things that were going against not only their beliefs, but their lifestyles. And this is why Zechariah uh, got murdered. And because he was preaching in the courtyard of the temples, the king decided to kill him. This is what Jesus is bringing to light. The point here is that when you live a righteous life, it doesn't matter if the world comes against you. It's going to come against you hard. And people will say, well, why doesn't God, why didn't God protect Zechariah? Well, in my view, he did. He protected Zechariah in this case. He took him home. And Zechariah was righteous in the eyes of the Lord. So we have to remember Zechariah had faith. He was preaching on faith at the time they stoned him. The king ordered the people to stone him, his soldiers to stone Zechariah, because Zechariah was preaching on the faith and the lack of faith. So let's look at 1 John 3.12. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. So this is one of the few places in the Bible where we get an indication uh, through John what happened with Cain and Abel. Now look at the last part of this scripture. Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Again, going to the Lord with faith Going to the Lord, giving your first. Not giving whatever you think God would like. The first fruits is what's being addressed in John. The first fruits were being addressed in Genesis. And God knows our first fruits. He knows what we're going to give. He knows before we know what we're going to give. But if we have faith, if we love Jesus, we're going to give him our first fruits. Always, we'll give them the best of what God gives us. We will give it back to him. And again, let's put this all in context. The Hebrew author is talking to Christian Jews at the time he's writing and penning and preaching this word. And he pulls the Old Testament uh, men and women up front to show how righteous they are and how God loves the righteous, and how God will reward us. Because when we become righteous, we become more diligent to seeking the Lord. Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away, so that he did not see death, 
and was not found because God had taken him. Before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So what does it mean here when the author is saying before he was taken, he had testimony that he pleased God? He was living his life for the Lord. And he put everything before God. And God found pleasure in his life. And how he brought everything forward to God and laid it at God's feet. He lived a righteous life. And that's what the author is talking about. He was taken away so that he did not see death. So we can all conclude what that really means. He was taken before he was um, found dead or murdered or whatever the circumstance. God took him home is what it really means. Through or and was not found. And what does that mean? That means that he was not found. His body was whisked away into heaven. Again, it's another sign of righteousness. Living a righteous life, life will always find pleasure in the Lord's eyes. Again, another example that Enoch gives us. Let's look at scripture, Genesis, Genesis 5, 21 through 24. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, can you imagine living 365 years? And he lived in a time where there was a lot of corruption. And again, if you look at, you know, some of the men and women who lived in these corrupt environments, and there are many examples that we're going to cover as we get into uh, chapter 11 more, we'll see many more men who have faith, who were righteous in the eyes of the Lord. And Enoch certainly was one of those. And it was after he had his son that he really started to focus his life on God. And he walked with God 300 years. So remember, 60, the first 65 years, he had his son at 65 years old. And then after he had his son, he realized the gift that God had given him. And he started to live his life for God. And we can think that. Maybe uh, his son was the cause of that. But whatever the cause, he decided on his own to serve God and serve God with all his heart. And he became a righteous man. And he lived for 300 years after that. 365 years he lived. And he walked with God. Now, what does he mean? Was God standing next to him in physical form? No, in spirit. He walked with God. His life was a godly life, the same life that we can have, our godly lives. If we walk with God today, that's our spiritual walk. That is us being strengthened in our walk with him. And he was not. And all that means he was not. He was not found. They could not find a body because God took him. And it, why do we know that? Because it's saying here in Scripture 5, verse 24. Genesis. He took him. Let's look at verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This is our key verse. This is what I want to focus on. Your faith pleases God, is the title of our message today. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, what is the scripture telling us? That without faith, we don't believe. With this belief, we have no relationship. Why do we think that displeases God? With little faith. We have little belief. 
with great faith, we have great belief, and we have a very strong relationship with God. This is what the author is telling us, not just the first century church, but us, not the Christian Jew. He's telling all of us that this with great faith, God is going to find great pleasure in us. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So with your faith, as your faith grows, you want to know the Lord more. And as you want to know the Lord more, he will reveal to you who he is, who his son is. Then your faith grows more and more. In prayer, when God answers your prayer, your faith grows. And that is how we develop that strong relationship with the Lord. It's not the fact that the Lord wants us to have a relationship so he'll do whatever we ask. That's not what he's saying. That's not what the author's saying. That's not what Scripture says. What Scripture says is if you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and you have faith, the Lord will pour into you more faith, and the Lord will answer your prayers. And as he answers your prayers, he will pour more into you. And your relationship will become stronger because it automatically comes to a point where when you have the slightest of issue, you will go to the Lord. When you are happy, when things are happy in your life, you will go to the Lord. You will give God glory in all things. Let's look at Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's not just in time of need that we should go to the throne of grace. When we pray, we should seek forgiveness of our sins. So when we go to the throne of grace, that we have a clean heart. So we're not carrying a bunch of extraneous baggage. And once we seek that forgiveness, we need to believe it. We need to have the Lord working on us. And then when we're talking to the Lord and we're laying our burdens at his feet, he knows our sincerity. And he knows that we cannot handle certain things in our lives. And when we ask him to help us, when we ask him to give us strength, he will do that. When we hand over our problems to him, he will take them. It doesn't matter what the problem is, how big, how small, how insignificant you think the problem is. God thinks every problem we have is significant, and he is there to answer and to support us and to provide for us and to protect us and to remind us how much he loves us. Not because he wants to coerce us into having a relationship with him. It's because he loves us. And he loves you. And he loves me. So much so that his, he poured that same love into his son. And his son walked in ministry for three plus years. And experienced the same persecutions that we experienced back in the first century all the way until today. Just so we could understand that there was... Someone who felt the same pain, the same glory, the same satisfactions, the same hurt as we did. So we could develop that strong relationship with Christ. That's how much God loves us. Let's look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark, for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, this is the third. Okay, we talked about Enoch. We talked about Noah. And we talked about Cain and Abel. These are three examples, and they're very strong examples on how these men had faith and they heard God speaking to them. And they knew without question that this was God. 
Now put yourself in Noah's position. He lived in a town that was corrupt. He lived in a place where God was very angry with the people. And God spoke to him. And out of everybody, I believe this, God spoke to Noah, but I believe God was speaking to others around him. And Noah was the only one who stood up and answered God's call. And he was able to hear God precisely and succinctly to say, to hear God say, build an ark, prepare your family. And we find out that Noah built an ark. He prepared his family. God brought all the animals to the ark. It wasn't Noah bringing the animals. You know how long it would take for Noah to gather up all the animals that would fit on the ark? Too much time because God's timeline was ticking. Noah had so much time. He could not get help from the townspeople, from his community to build the ark. He had his family. So his family also stepped out in faith. And what does God say? He found righteousness in this man, Noah, because he was faithful to hear and move when God said move. Abel was faithful because when God said, give me a sacrifice, Abel gave him the best of the best. Enoch was faithful because he put God before him and he turned his life around. In a, an environment of corruption, he decided to follow God for 300 years, it tells us. It doesn't tell us what his life was in the 65 years before his son, but it certainly tells us the 300 years after. So these are three examples where God speaks to us, and God is pleased with the faithful. That we know if we are faithful, if we have the faith of these men, as God is working in our lives, God will be pleased with us. And he will bless us. And the ultimate blessing is an eternity in heaven with the king and his son. That's the ultimate blessing. But God will bless us along the way. He will bless us in our lives. He will bless those around us that believe. And through those blessings, we need to share who he is. And through our faith, we need to express our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and what it means to us and what it could mean to those who don't believe, to the non-believer. Let's look at 1 Peter 3.20. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. We all remember the story. We all remember this scripture in Peter. And we all should remember this, that Noah had faith. Enoch had faith. Abel had faith. And there are consequences for your lack of faith. And is that God disappointed in our lack of faith? Absolutely, he is. Because conversely, with great faith, he's pleased. And we can see a lack of faith in Cain. That he thought that he could just give anything he wanted to the Lord and it should be acceptable. Again, I go back to pride. Again, I go back to, you know, an attitude that is displeasing to the Lord. Let's look at Romans 3. 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Even the righteousness of God through the faith in Jesus Christ. That's the point I want to pull out of this scripture here. Through our faith in Jesus Christ. Without faith in Jesus Christ, you will not find the kingdom of heaven. You will not find the kingdom of heaven unless you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the new covenant. 
That is the covenant that God has made with us. And then you say, well, what about those before Christ? Well, guess what? Those before Christ will find a place in heaven also. If they loved God with all their heart, mind, and soul, they will find that same place. But a non-believer will not find it, whether it's pre-Christ or post-Christ. The key is you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You receive His Son, Jesus Christ, after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension into heaven. Then we find king, the kingdom. And that's what this scripture is saying, even the righteousness of God. And Paul teaches this. He not only teaches it here, but he teaches it in Thessalonians. This is one of the primary messages coming out of 1 Thessalonians. That pre-Christ, if you believed and gave your life to God and lived a godly life, you will find the kingdom of heaven. If not, you're lost. Just like you're lost today, if you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ in you, and you don't have that relationship, you're lost. But there's hope. Here's the hope. Receive Jesus. Sacrifice your life. Die to yourself. Come to Christ. Allow the Lord to live in you, to build faith in you to show you, to reveal who he is to you. Allow that to happen. Let's look at our encouraging verse for today, Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see how God clearly connects the dots for us? The faith is from God. The righteousness that we have is through the faith that we have. The pleasure that we give to God when we serve him is through the faith that we are going to do the things that God calls us to do. And what is Paul saying in this scripture? He's saying that through the law, you can feel you are righteous. You can have your own worldly righteousness. It is meaningless in the kingdom of heaven. It is meaningless to Jesus Christ if you reject him. It is meaningless to God if you reject his son and you reject God. It is meaningful when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You receive him. You live your life for God and his son. That's when it becomes meaningful. Let's conclude. In life, we are given many opportunities to have faith and trust in the Lord. It is through these opportunities that God should be on the forefront of our lips. Every opportunity we have, we should be speaking of the Lord. We should be pointing and glorifying God. We should always direct others to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through our faith in these opportunities that God finds pleasure in us. It is not through our disbelief, through our worries through our anguish. None of these emotions will get us closer to God. It is through the love of Christ and his Father that we can find peace in every trial that comes before us. But only when we believe in this, in his word, believe he is real and truly our Father in heaven. Let's look at Romans 420. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So our unbelief will not strengthen our faith. Our disbelief will not strengthen our faith. What strengthens our faith is that relationship that God wants to have with you. 
What strengthens our faith is our righteousness. The pleasure that God has in us strengthens our faith. And how do we strengthen our faith? We give glory to God. We live for God. We understand that God is a creator of all things, all universes, every one of them. And when we believe that, when we give glory to God for those things, he will find favor in us. Just as he did Abel, just as he did Enoch, just as he did Noah. And we're going to continue on next week with more examples, Abraham, for example, and others. A lot, how they had faith and how God protected them. Even to the point of taking them home and never seeing death, as we've seen in Enoch. There are many men and women in the Bible of faith. If you just read the Word, read the Old Testament, read the New Testament, the apostles had faith. Yes, they could see Jesus, but it took them a while to understand that he is the Son of God. But they still followed. They still had faith. They still heard his message. They still felt his love. And that's what we need. We need to hear his message. We need to feel his love. We need to believe. And we need to know this. It is written in the Bible, the last chapter, that God's judgment will fall upon us. And the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ will keep us from God's judgment because we will be in heaven with him. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you for your word today, Father God in heaven. And I just ask, Father, if there's anybody out there who is sitting on a fence, who has a lack of faith, Father, pour into them. Father, who is a non-believer out there, let's pray this. Father God in heaven, forgive me of my sins. Lord, allow me to come to your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart. Father, I want to live my life for you and only you for the rest of my days. And Lord, continue to reveal you and your son to me that my faith may grow from a mustard seed to a mustard tree. Father God in heaven, I thank you. If you prayed that prayer, then welcome aboard. And contact us, reach out to us if you need any support, spiritual support, moral support. If you have questions on the Bible, please contact us. And let's pray this out. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, bring to my mind those things you want me to remember. Lord, bring to my heart those things you want to change in me. And Lord, bring to my lips those words you want me to speak for the rest of my days. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all say, Amen. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful, blessed week. And please contact us if you have any issues. If you have prayer needs, we're here to pray. We're here to support. Thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Amen.